All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome in. So, uh, Tyson, we're less than a month away from the start of NFL free agency, right? Legal tampering period. It's it's going to be insane. The Jets obviously have a bunch of different needs. Backup quarterback, uh, offensive line at so many different spots, tackle or, uh, you know, starters, depth wide receivers, uh, you know, the list goes on, right? The Jets have a lot of work in front of them, right? There, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, in my opinion, bullet points that Joe Douglas needs to hit within March. You know, that that's the bottom line. We cannot, pers- I, I can't speak for anybody else, but personally, I'm going to be really, really disappointed if the first couple of waves of free agency are continuing to go by and we're just not doing anything right these free agents are getting picked up elsewhere and we're just kind of standing pat uh i don't think that'll be the case but tyson what's going on man how's it going and what's kind of your initial take right with uh less than a month out for free agency well how how was your first sunday without football super bowl you know now we're like now it's truly dog days of the off season right yeah i did it was good man i went to the beach <laughs> that's that florida life man it's not fair how cold is it up north? Like thirty degrees. We had snow like Friday, dude. It's terrible. Let oh. me let me uh, <laughs> let me look how cold it is right now it's on the weather fair. app. <laughs> so not fair, man. This night is rubbing it in my face at this point. All right, so it's sixty-two right now. <laughs> sixty-two down here, which is which is pretty cold. That's why I'm wearing the hoodie. But um, <laughs> yeah, dude, first, first Sunday. I mean, it's always a little weird, you know, like post Super Bowl and stuff yeah. like that, like no football. Um, but at the same time, like I, I'm just so done with the 2023 season that I'm so focused on 2024 and the improvements that we can make, you know, for this team. And and yeah, I'm totally excited. Well, now it's like you're looking at all the latest news: who's going to be available, who's not going to be available, who's going to get cut. You know, what's the top free agent? You know, who the Jets going to pursue actively on day one, day two, or like that. And there's a lot of news the last couple of days too, man. Where rumors are coming out, and I guess the first one that caught my attention is the Bakhtiari thing or Green Bay where it's an it's an obvious fit, man. Best friends with Aaron Rodgers. He he could address potentially a need, depending on how you look at him, at left tackle or depth or a leader. So what are your thoughts? I mean, him being cut's not a surprise because it's a huge cap savings for the Packers. But what were your initial thoughts, which is a player we've talked about probably four or five times over the last couple of months? Yeah, I mean, it just kind of seems like inevitable that he's going to be yeah. a Jet, right? Um so for me, when I look at Bakhtiari, still a really, really good player, still a you know a, a massive upgrade over what, you know what we currently had a year ago, uh, Becton, Dwayne Brown, that whole uh, situation. When I look at Dwayne Brown, though, as a potential acquisition, I'm viewing him as a depth move, like a cheap one-year contract. Because when I think about the future left tackle of this football team in a win-now season – with a 40 year old Aaron Rodgers, I want somebody who can we who we can depend on. Yeah. Somebody who's not going to get hurt, somebody who we can rely on. And it's not just me as a fan, but as a coaching staff, um, players around him, right? Bakhtiari played in one game last year. He's yeah. missed 45 games since 2020. Yeah. He's had five surgeries on the same knee since 2020. You know, this isn't dating back to college or anything. Five surgeries since 2020 on the same knee. That is a ton. Uh, the big question mark is health, right? 32 years old. But at this point in time, I'm, I am I just don't want to see the Jets roll out like a, you know, two-year, $20 million contract or something for Bakhtiari, and he comes in and plays three games for us. Now, of course, you know, that's up in the air. We can't really predict injuries, but we can look at track records, and we can look at you know, injury history and how they project moving forward. For me, I would sign Bakhtiari, but cheap one year deal as a depth move. This cannot be the ta- the the sole tackle acquisition that the Jets make. And you know, everybody's congratulating Joe Douglas, like great, great job. This is it. Like and, and we've talked about this too on previous podcasts. The way I'm viewing offensive line right now, or how I would attack the market, signing one starter. Left side or right side, signing one starter, signing one depth piece, drafting one starter at spot number 10. And then the hope is Carter Warren or Max Mitchell can step up as that backup right tackle. No, I agree, dude. It's got to be, it's got to be like a depth competition kind of guy. And that's, but you can't count on to be like a long term starter. He's got to be like a, a piece to your puzzle, but not expensive, incentive laid contract. And then you go from there. But what would you consider? What about a Becton Bakhtiari competition at left tackle? Well, we'd have to bring Becton back. 
I mean, that's what I'm saying. They'll bring like that. So you sign Bakhtiari. He's your perceived starter. Beckton's his competition, which maybe he'll come back cheap coming off a poor season. Maybe he wants to stay play with Aaron Rodgers, his you know, good friend of his. Would you consider that? Or are you like, you know what? Bakhtiari and go get Fashanu or somebody else. You know, I, I think on paper it sounds really, really good. You know, I think going into training camp, we would like it would be okay. It wouldn't be the worst situation in the world, but like I could very well see the season starting out. And if things don't go our way, or if there's a couple injuries there, it's like, oh, the solution for the New York Jets to fix their injury riddled offensive line with no reliability, no durability, guys that are up there in age, we're going to fix that. The solution is to add guys that aren't dependable, aren't reliable, and guys that have long track rec- uh, long track records of injuries. And it's like, what are we doing? You know, that type of thing. Per- personally, I would like to see, you know, Becton and Dwayne Brown, like, aside, one depth move, one starter. So whether that's a Tyron Smith and a backup, like Tyron Smith and James Hurst, whether that's David Bakhtiari and Jonah Williams, uh, you know, Mike on Wenu and Bakhtiari, that's cool. And then you just go and draft the other one at, at spot number 10. That's, again, that's kind of my outlook on it. But – I just want to have sure things on the O-line. I don't want to have question marks and just crossing my fingers every single week. Oh, hopefully this guy doesn't get hurt in practice. You know, yeah, now, but, but, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I agree with you, but Tyron Smith's got injury concerns too. He's not like he plays 17 games every year. So I agree with you. Like that's my concern. It's like, but I'm, I'm my, my fear is that we can't, we're not, not can't afford, we can afford anybody, but we don't get the top guys. You don't get Jonah Williams. You don't get those guys. Tyron Smith goes somewhere else. Do the Jets say, okay, we pivot now. I think Becton's gone, but say, you know what? We go Bakhtiari and Becton, we draft somebody, and we hope that works out for now, kind of like your plan B, plan C. You know, I, I don't know. Like, it's it's fascinating because I kind of was in my mind, like, think Becton has to go. But if Jonah Williams doesn't come here and, you know, Tyron Smith doesn't come here, what's your left tackle plan? Well, I mean, let me let me just kind of push back at, at, at you know, with the first part, why don't why don't you think the Jets could afford one of the top guys like Mike Onwenu, for example? Well, they, no, I think they can afford him. I'm not guaranteed. I don't think you can guarantee you can get them though. I'm I'm still I'm concerned with the Jets' vision as an organization, how they're going to handle this, and would somebody want to come play here with Sala, with Douglas, with Aaron Rodgers? On a, could be a potentially a one year deal. We're hoping two years. Maybe it's one year. Does a guy want to sign up for five years with the with the stability concerns, or do you want to go play somewhere else? Or does the almighty dollar matter the most? That's what I don't know. Because you figure a lot of teams that are a lot better than the Jets need offensive line help. So does that player say, you know what, I'll take a chance on the Jets, or do they go somewhere else? So I'm always kind of like a, what's your contingency kind of guy? What's your best case scenario is getting those guys, but if you don't have your best case scenario, what is your plan B? Because you don't want to sit here us a week in the free agency and be like, what in the hell are they doing? We're stuck. You know what I mean? That's, that's yeah. how I'm at. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's interesting, though, because, the, like, another big need, and we're going to talk about it, too, is wide receiver. So, on one hand, it's like – like so, like, I'm assuming you're talking about adding a wide receiver, whether – who you know, whoever it is, right, Calvin Ridley, Mike Evans, at a big number. Because yep. those guys aren't signing a one-year, $6 million deal, right? right? Signing one of those – bringing one of those guys in, and then – looking at left tackle saying, okay, Becton Bakhtiari, two cheaper guys. Is that kind of your plan right now? Or no, I mean, talking about? no my, my plan is spend big day one at their offensive line. Go after the guy that you covet the most and give him the best offer you can get. Hopefully you land him. You get him, great. And you get Bakhtiari's backup. I'm cool with that. I'm just concerned. Can the Jets actually get that done? And this is going to come off negative, but let's be honest. What big fish is Joe Douglas landing us in free agency over the over years? What big guy has he got? I'm like, wow, we got the biggest guy in the market. We were rumored to get him. We we're always in a mix to get him, Orlando Brown, whoever else. It didn't happen. So if that trend continues this year, what happens? What, what's our pivot? What's our adjustment? You, you get him, great, man. Like, listen, you go out and get whoever, you know, that's perfect. But, you know, this is the Jets, and it's it's you got to be a little skeptical at this point, no? Yeah, but I do think this, this offseason is a little bit different with Douglas. And as far as him maybe coming off of his, like, set prices for free agents that, like, Supposedly, like there's a bunch of different reports that Douglas like has his you know set price for all these different guys and he won't budge off of it. Um, I, I think this year's different. I think if his job is on the line, if I mean, I mean the fan base, there's so many uh, P 
people out there that are just so frustrated with how his team building has gone so far. Right. Uh, his overall record as a general manager is not good. And I mean, we can go down the list, break down all these different yeah. like shortcomings and whatnot. I don't want to dive too deep down that Rob, uh, you know, deep down the rabbit hole here, but all I know is Joe Douglas needs to turn this thing around. If he doesn't, if the Jets miss the playoffs again, everybody's fired. Yep. So in free agent conversations, I'm hoping he's having these conversations now with coaches and other front office members. There needs to be an aggressive push. And at the end of the day, you can't control players. They're, they're going to sign where they want to sign. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you think back, and I'm not the biggest OBJ fan, but if you go back and you watch OBJ's uh, podcast with Marlon Humphrey when he was talking about kind of the experience, yeah. he did mention a sense of, like, disrespect, come uh, like from the jets organization as in they think they're like the top dogs and i would be lucky to go there that mentality i do not like at all especially like okay it's one thing if you're kansas city it's one thing if you're san francisco right baltimore even buffalo right they're winning all these different uh you know they're winning the division every single year but you know you cannot be a seven win football team or under year in and year out and act like you're like in like you're in a better position than all these free agents. And then you continuously miss on these guys. So I think there has to be that mentality shift this off season, you know, ahead of free agency to ensure that we are landing these guys. We cannot keep swinging and missing, swinging and missing, or I guess in Douglas's case, uh, striking out looking. Yeah, I mean, there's a fine line between desperation and being aggressive, right? And I think the Jets were kind of arrogant, being like, you know what? We're a young team. We got Sauce. We got Brees. We got Garrett Wilson. And we have Aaron Rodgers. That's our selling point. Come play for the Jets. You're going to love it here. Okay? It didn't work out. So now there's more questions than answers because Rodgers coming off his injury, Salah on the hot seat, all these different things. And it's like, what's your sales pitch? If Andy Reid calls you or Robert Salah calls you, which phone call are you taking? Andy Reid. And that applies to almost every coach in the AFC when you're talking to Salah. Now, if Aaron Rodgers calls you, maybe that helps a little bit. And this is going to come off really, really negative. I I apologize for that, but it's this is the way business is done in the NFL. It's, okay, money is important. Also, it's winning, stability, and the next three or four years for the top free agents. The one-year guy, when we talk about receivers, all right, you want to give somebody a one-year deal? Okay, you get somebody a five-year deal. What am I dealing with for the next five years here? What And what's the Jets' track record? 13 years, no playoffs. That's where the Jets tax comes in. You know what? So Joe Douglas is now going to have to pay more to get somebody to come here, which he doesn't usually do. But he's going to have to. Like you said, his job is on the line. So for me, it's like if if the top – like I'm always curious to see what the league-wide perception is of the Jets from a player's perspective. How, what's, what do they look like on the outside looking in? You know, What does Dalvin Cook say when he leaves here? What do all these guys say once they leave here and they dealt with this firsthand? Michael Carter, Elijah Moore, all these players. You know what I mean? So it's going to be interesting and – you know, everybody, every Jeff fan has a wish. We, we have all the top free agents. We want them all. Give me him. Give me him. Give me him. Give me him. But if it doesn't happen, what's the other plan? So I try to figure out other ways. Could it be Bakhtiari and Beckton? Could it be somewhere else? Like the, the guy from the England you keep mentioning, I love him. But it's just left tackle is the biggest concern. And when you see all these mock drafts, they're great. But it's like what happens if free agency first also determines what could happen in your draft as well. So offensive line is fascinating to me. Um you know, and like, then you look at all the top free agents as well as a lot of these guys have concerns. If an offensive line becomes available, it's for a reason. Getting older, plays declined, or he's making too much money, right? So, like, would you be, like, Tyron Smith, if that's the Jets' number one guy, would you be completely cool with that? Like, you know what? Have him, Bakhtiari's his backup, and let's roll. Yeah, I'm totally, you know, totally down for that. Tyron Smith yep. and Bakhtiari yep. ahead of the draft, so we yep. can go out and draft uh, Fuaga at right tackle. Yep. I mean, that's Slam that's down. awesome. I, I mean, at that point, you would just hope that Carter Warren in camp or Max Mitchell can step up to be a backup right tackle yep. because at that point in time, the, and again, this is kind of just my personal outlook on it, you're checking every single box. You're adding veterans. You're adding talent. You're adding depth. you got two solid starters. Yep. you got two or I guess one solid backup option of Bakhtiari and then a competition battle at right tackle. At the end of the day – no team is perfect, right? The Chiefs are going to have question marks. The Chiefs had question marks this year. They won the Super Bowl, right? Uh, every team has, you know, some sort of area of concern on the roster, uh, if not multiple ones. 
So I don't want to get too far ahead of myself and say, oh, the Jets have to be perfect at every single position. It's just not realistic. Right. But at the same time, Douglas has been here since 2019, and the offensive line has been horrible from the beginning. Yep. Every single year passes, and the offensive line is an issue, whether it's the inside or the outside, depth, talent, whatever it is. We're sitting here right now in 2024 thinking, okay, now we're in a position where we've disappointed record-wise. We now have to overpay yep. to for, to essentially lock offensive linemen in. That's just the situation that we're in, so we have to do it. I, I just don't see it an alternative, though. Pass and just say, oh, no, you guys are too expensive. See ya. We're just going to roll with the same exact group that we had last year. Yeah. I mean, no and blame just bad luck on Aaron Rodgers injury and just say, okay, well, you know, he's going to be fine. I mean, you, you just kind of want more foresight from the organization, but no, I mean, your plan, if the Jets bring in Tyron Smith and David Bakhtiari, and we haven't even hit the draft yet, I would be totally, totally pumped up. Now, is there a world where the Jets can say, you know what, we'll sign Bakhtiari and they look to the draft to give us our competition for him? Which to me, I hate that plan. I absolutely would hate it because then you're going to get desperate in the draft. You may be forced to trade up then, or you may not get the guy you want. But could that be a world where, like, you know what, Bakhtiari is our kind of bench, our placeholder, and in the draft we're going to truly address our biggest need? It's tough because it's like the, I'm a Jets fan, right? Joe Douglas is not a Jets fan. He's, he's the GM for the team. So he's going to make the best move for the team probably in, in 2024, the short term, one year. Yep. Um, but the way I want to look at the draft is I want to draft a building block for the next 10 years. Yes. You know, so this is the weird crossroads where we're at, where it's like, you know, are, are we just going to throw out certain qualities and just go for that one year, you know, instant impact guy? Because yeah. I, I know some fans, you know, I've talked about maybe, uh, potentially wide receiver if one falls. Uh, to the Jets at spot number 10. And even some like pretty big mock drafts have the Jets going wide receiver. But for me, I, I'm i going offensive line, and I'm not necessarily dictating it off of what we do in free agency. Mm -hmm. But if we sign Tyron Smith, right, at left tackle, let's just say a two-year contract, mm -hmm. and David Bakhtiari, left tackle, one-year deal, I would be more inclined to go draft Fuwaga at right tackle yes. as opposed to Fashanu at left tackle. Now, if Joe Alt falls, it's a different story. I think just the team builder future person inside me just says draft Alt and just try to figure out right tackle later, uh, potentially move one of your left tackles, I guess, at that point. But, yeah, or, you know, for example, if the Jets sign Mike Onwenu, four-year contract from New England, yeah. boom, he's the starting team. He's, he's the right tackle you know, for the foreseeable future, I'm probably more inclined to target Fashanu if he falls yep. to try to trade back and, you know, go out and select a, you know, a left tackle, right. Jordan Morgan or something like that. If, if we can slide back um, from Arizona. So that's kind of the way I'm thinking of it. Free agency of course is, is step number one though. Now for just a quick draft question, because I, I studied the draft but not like you guys do now to me, it seems like there's only two, legitimate left tackles that you consider a 10 would you, you'd say that like legitimate like they play left tackle primarily would you say that's true i would say right now you know like it's before the combine and whatnot uh but the tackle class from top to i mean we i think we talked about this last time too the tackle class i think there's six tackles in this class that are upgrades over what like the jets can draft six different players and those six players would come in as better better or I guess upgrades over what we had last year, whether it's at left or right tackle. But for in terms of left tackle, though, you'd feel comfortable with the, what Fashano and Alt at number ten at left tackle. Other than that, you're saying you know what, it could probably be a right tackle. I would, yeah. Okay, no, that's that's what I'm kind of what I'm thinking too. So it's like it's uh, this this free agency is going to be fascinating, dude. And now you're watching for maybe some surprise cuts that an offensive lineman surprise that's available, but um, it's going to be a little interesting. And the other. We talk about wide receiver a little bit too, and it's really because we both agree we need another we need a good number two or like a one eight to Garrett Wilson. And we we're talking before the show that you know the Mike Evans thing is going to become interesting because I personally thought that he'd become a Buccaneer for life. I thought they would find a way to keep him. He wanted to stay. You know, chemistry at Mayfield. I'm sure I'm assuming Mayfield goes back there. So you figure, all right, maybe Evans is going to be off the board, but now he could be available, and he kind of be a really good figure because you're not giving up any draft compensation. 
you know, older, experienced, still very good. He'd probably flourish with Aaron Rodgers. This Mike Evans thing is, I guess, Bears watching now. Yeah, dude, 100. percent I so it was reported that they're still far apart. The Bucks and Evans are still far apart on a uh, you know on the contract extension. Today was the soft deadline, so the Bucks essentially have to eat over seven million dollars in dead cap, whether you know Evans is back or not. Right. So the the hope was okay, you could extend Evans, get him under contract uh, for what he wants, and then you can lower that that yep. dead cap uh, that dead cap hit number. Yep. Um, that's not the case though. So I think he could still be back as far as the franchise tag goes. That's at this point out the door because it looks like the bucks are going to be tagging Winfield at safety. So I think, man, like you look at Mike Evans fit with the jets, obviously he wouldn't have to be like the dude, like he wouldn't have to be Batman here. And and, because people have talked about the Panthers as like a potential fit because Dave Canales is there. They have a lot of money to throw at wide receivers. They need wide receiver help. They want to get Bryce Young some help. Um, but it's like you put Mike Evans in Carolina, and maybe he wants that role. I don't know, but he would have to like literally do everything. Like he's going to get all the looks from defenses and whatnot. But with the Jets, it's like you got Brees Hall in the backfield and Garrett Wilson opposite with Rodgers throwing you the football. Evans is clearly, clearly better than every other receiver that we have on the roster. Provides size, high point ability, 50-50 balls, red zone. I mean, he's a he's surprise, you know, based off his size, like he's a surprising deep threat as well. Like he always is making plays down the field. He's consistent. He plays. He has a Super Bowl championship. No matter what coach, quarterback, or system, he's always out there producing. I would love it. And he, and he could probably get away with getting a two-year deal, too. Like, I think if you go Ridley, Higgins, whoever else, you're talking four- or five-year deal. The, the Mike Evans thing kind of kind of goes right along with Rodgers. One- or two-year deal along with Rodgers. The money's going to be high, but you know what you're getting. And it's like that could actually probably work a little better for the Jets and their advantage. Being tail end of his career, he wants to win, doesn't want to rebuild, nothing like that. So it's ideal. But the Ridley thing is really fascinating because say in a world that – say Evans goes back to the Bucks. If Ridley and Higgins gets franchise tag or whatever happens to Higgins, Ridley could be the biggest commodity out there in terms of name, young kid, you know, young guy on the rise, had a decent comeback year from the Jaguars, only going to get better. Would you would you make him your primary target and give him big time money? Be like, you know what? We need to invest a wide receiver. He's our guy. Give him that big splashy four year deal because he's based on the, the limited market. He's the guy we have to go after. And Joe Douglas has reportedly liked him a lot in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think the Jets will definitely be interested in Calvin, and it also looks like the Jags are going to use their franchise tag uh, yep. elsewhere. They yep. also have to worry about Josh Allen too, yep. you know, the their pass rusher. So I think there's a really, really big, uh, really high chance that Calvin Ridley does hit the open market. Uh, my question though, Michael Pittman, that's another guy who that's I'm just, guy. I mean, that's. You want to talk about durability, somebody who plays consistent, yeah. helps out in the running game, size six foot four, coming off the best season of his career, too. And also, it's been reported that Pittman is excited to test free agency. Like he's really excited to kind of see what teams throw at him and stuff. Uh, the different, it really just like the recruiting process. So Pittman is another guy who ah, it would be tough for me, you know, if, I guess if both of them are on the market and I feel good about an offensive line plan. Then, oh, man, I, I would be, I guess, you know, I would be totally pumped with both. Yeah, me too. That, that's the bottom line. As far as which one I would pick or target first, I think I would probably go with with Pittman. Yeah, me too. But it's, it's like splitting hairs. The only thing with Calvin Ridley is the drops. If Calvin Ridley did not have the drop problem that he did last year, I would, you know, my answer would be Ridley. But – I don't know. It's just like you talk to Jags fans and they will literally tell you like they lost games because of Calvin Ridley's drops. Yep. And I, you know, you'd write some of that off too, like his first year back and getting in the flow yeah. and all these different things, getting used to the quarterback. And you know, it's, I like him a lot as a player, but Pittman's the guy, dude, that is the I mean him. I mean, I love Higgins too, but I just, I get worried that they're not going to become available when, you know, it's right now it's a lot of, a lot of negotiating behind the scenes. Mike Evans is fascinating. I was kind of like, I kind of gave up on him. You gave me hope again. Cause I'm like, all right, that's, that's 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 a perfect fit for this team. It really is, dude. Two year guy, older, playing for a ring, motivated. He'll be a number, good number, like one A to Garrett Wilson. He, he checked, and he's gonna want money to pay him. We have the money. They, Jets can create space. Like, I'm not worried about that kind of stuff. So that makes it really, really interesting at this point. 
So here's a wide receiver that I feel like nobody's talking about. I mean, I guess as far as the Jets go, Hollywood Brown. Yeah. Where do you kind of stand with him? In terms of speed, would be a, he'd be a good fit. He'd actually get another dimension to the offense. But where where would you target him? Like what? Like he'd probably be like a, your plan B, plan C, right? It's not like your top guys. Probably after the first two three days of free agents and the big contracts go out, he probably won't be involved in those, right? He's going to be like that second tier, second wave of free agency. You would think that, or he would be my first wave guy if we we spend the money in O line. Okay. And it's not to say that I think Hollywood. It's not like Hollywood's going to get five mil a year. You know, right. like he's going to get a, a nice deal, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but man, I just I feel like people are sleeping on him. You know, like the, the speed, the deep threat. Like we just don't throw the ball downfield at all. Yeah. And you know, part of that's Hackett, but a part of that was personnel. We just didn't have the people to do that. Hardman, you know, never even got in the games. Well, I mean, so, Gibson, Gibson's got some speed. They didn't. He, they didn't use him. But I mean, I'm not going to compare Gibson to Brown. But you're right. We need that vertical threat. You definitely need that, especially in this offense. Stretch the field, open up the middle, free up Conklin, free up you know all these other routes. That I mean, it makes sense because I mean that's definitely something we needed. We had Hardman, but they didn't even use him. So it's he's going to get money. He's definitely going to get paid some serious coin though. Brown. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm just trying to think like if the Jets maybe release a player or two, ask one to take a pay cut, maybe restru restructure one or two deals, and we're looking at like you know maybe double what we had initially going in. I, I would, you know, I would not mind at all. No we way. go out and sign, say, like a Mike on Wenu and a Hollywood Brown, or like you said before, like Bakhtiari, Tyron Smith, and like one of these mid tier receivers. Tyler Boyd's another uh, yep. player that I feel like, you know, you compare Tyler Boyd to Randall Cobb. Yep. That's 39 receiving yards from Randall Cobb last year to what Tyler Boyd can bring you in the middle of the field. I think that would be a humongous fit for. You know, you don't have to pay Tyler Boyd 25 mil a season or some crazy astronomical number. Yep. Um, so I, I think the good news here is there is options. Even if Higgins is off the board, even if Pittman's off the board, we you know, we, we can still talk about like three or four solid, legitimate, realistic options. It's not like there's that one guy. Yep. You know, like I, I'm I'm trying to think of an example. Um I guess maybe Fletcher Cox last year, or like a, like he was like the top end defensive tackle, um, but yeah, I, I think that's 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 the bright spot of the silver lining. We have there, there's plenty of guys in my opinion that make sense for the Jets, and we could also afford them. Yeah, and that's the thing. You're looking for upgrades. You know, wide receiver. You don't need to have five superstars. You want upgrades of what we currently have. So if you want to go Curtis Samuel, Tyler Boyd, all these guys, it works, dude. Because you figure you have Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers is going to get these guys the ball as long as they're. Professional route runners that could catch the ball consistently. That's all you want. And we haven't had that. You know, Lazard's been a disaster. Hartman didn't really play. You know, Brownlee, Gibson, good players, young, very inexperienced. You want guys that, you know, Rodgers can trust most importantly, which we saw in Stanton Hard Knocks. They're talking about that. Like, listen, you got to be where you're supposed to be or your ball's not coming to you. You know, so that's – there's definitely plenty of options. And I'm like, it's like the Jets may not go the high spender route at wide receiver. They may go to lesser tier, but it's still going to help them. They're still going to be good because you still have Garrett Wilson too. So – it's it's interesting, but there's a name that I want to talk to you about because, dude, it caught me off guard. I had no idea. I was busy watching UFC and all this other stuff this weekend. And the, the one guy I'm hanging out, he's like, yo, dude, he's like, what do you think about Jamal Adams? I'm like, Jamal Adams? I'm like, I'm glad he's gone. He's like, glad he's gone. I'm like, he's like, what about coming back? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, no way, dude. There's no, there's so many reasons why I was like, I thought it was a joke. And then I go on social media. I'm like, what is all this nonsense? Jamal like in tweets and there's a, there's a hint he may want to come back here. And my answer right at the bat was no, 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 and absolutely not. Never even think about it. What do you think about this nonsense? So let me ask you. So you say no, right? Is right. that for personal reasons or like why are you so against it? Just just devil's advocate. Because he here. doesn't stay. He doesn't. He's not. He no longer stays healthy. He's a liability in coverage. His tackling is suspect. He's a distraction off the field. He's, he's more of a name than he's a player at this point. And I think for the for what he does bring to the game, which would be like what like a linebacker kind of play. You could probably get for cheaper at Chuck Clark. You bring him back. Like I'd have that Chuck Clark. I just don't want the distraction. I don't want the drama. And from a personal perspective, he basically spit in our face in a way out. He basically just, you know, he like he just wanted out. He was he was like, I don't want to be a part of this rebuild. I don't want to be part. Like I'm all about winning. And he was just he came up with a phony. So I'm like, you know, the young culture of this team. I think he's the last thing you need on off the field for the Jets. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I you I, want him back, yeah. don't you? Do you want him back? 
So it, it's tough <laughs> because – so to answer your question, no, I, I don't think right. he will be back. I don't think it would be smart to bring him back. But at the time, he was my favorite player. On the Jets. Loved yeah. him out of LSU. Loved his play. Like old school, traditional, strong safety. Awesome against the run. QB spy. Yeah. Great against mobile quarterbacks. Like man on man coverage against tight ends. Like in the middle of the field. Like Jamal Adams to me was like, like he was that dude. Like building block, big hitter. Um, I mean, again, at the time, kind of seemed like the, the leader of the defense. Yeah. Oh, oh, him and Marcus May only seemed like the player it really felt like those were the only two guys that like actually cared about like winning and like trying to turn the thing around as opposed to like just being fine with losing. And I remember watching those like Todd Bowles press conferences. They were, you know, nauseating just like after losses, just like, it just didn't seem like anybody cared about losing, but you like you, you, you sense that frustration from Adams, but at the end of the day, no, I'm with you. I I think right off the bat, the jets don't need another storyline going into the year. Number two, I don't think he fits the system. You know, it's like a you know a constant drop down safety. Yep. Um, I think his best fit would be uh, would be with the, either the Falcons or the Steelers. Yep. Like to pair up with uh, Minka Fitzpatrick with Pittsburgh, where he can be that drop down, make plays in the box, make plays in the running game, uh, and then you have Fitzpatrick kind of roaming the back end of the defense. Same with uh, Atlanta with Jesse Bates, um, and then you know obviously Ricky Morris is their their head coach, so. I think there's better fits for Adams. I would rather spend free agent money because these are valuable, valuable dollars, man. I'm investing it in offensive line. If you can land offensive linemen and have a solid, you know, protection plan for your quarterback, everything thrives. The running game thrives, wide receivers thrive, the play calling thrives, the quarterback obviously has more time to throw and process. And as well, you know, from a defense perspective. You know, if you cannot get after the quarterback unless you're blitzing, that puts you at a ma- at a major disadvantage if you're a defensive coordinator playing the Jets. Yeah. So that's why offensive line is like my number one priority, no matter what. Yeah, me. It's offensive line, wide receiver, and the very close position to that is backup quarterback, which you talked about today a little bit. Whereas, like, and I got I was I was cracking yeah. jokes. I I saw your post on on X where it was like the New York Jets are really high. I started laughing at that. But then it was on on Sam Howell, and it's interesting because the Jets definitely need a young backup quarterback. Not a young backup quarterback, but a quality backup quarterback. So tell me your thoughts on that. I didn't see the whole Sam Howell thing, so give me some scoop on that. Yeah, so basically Connor Hughes of SNY reported that uh, there's some people within the Jets organization that are high on Sam Howell. And with Washington obviously picking second overall, new uh, regime, new, you know, general man like everything's new new owners yep. new general manager new head coach new offensive coordinator all these different things sam howell is part of the old regime right so the thought is okay well if he's really young and he did flash yeah, we can yeah. just draft our future to Jaden daniels drake may whoever and we could just move on from Howell and you know recoup a, you know whatever it is a mid-round pick form or something like that and help out the new regime with your new young quarterback because Howell is only 23, I believe. Yeah. So, and I mean, I guess it, it doesn't hurt to keep him on the roster, but uh, the point was basically, hey, if Howell could be on the move, if Washington isn't opposed to, you know, listening to offers and you're a team in the New York Jets who is about to trade Zach Wilson, you don't have a young quarterback on the roster, you need a backup then maybe it can make some sense. Now, Howell, to me, is a guy who I like. Yep. Good arm, ball placement, deep ball accuracy. He threw for just under 4,000 passing yards last year uh, with a horrible offensive line. He was sacked 65 times. Yep. Um, and I think you know Howell off of play action, really good mechanics, footwork, all that kind of stuff, moves well in the pocket, kind of evades you know, guys. Um, uh, I, th- I, think, I think there is something there to Howell, especially because he's super, super young. And he's a fifth round pick too. So he's not $10 million, $15 million, nothing like that. It's, it's literally fifth round pick money for two years yep. on under contract. So if you're the Jets, could you move maybe one of your fourth round picks and like a future pick or a comp pick for Howell? Um, I think the biggest, I would say negative is that Howell last season was so up and down. Like he would have the four INT game. Yep. He would have the game where he was benched against the Jets uh, but he would have, you know, some great games. And if I'm the New York Jets right now, 
I think you want more consistency from the backup quarterback position, not, you know, up and down roller coaster ride. We're losing games because of QB. You know, so my kind of take on it was, yeah, let's go get Howell. Like I'm down to move a late round pick for him or a mid round pick for him, but I also want a veteran. So the plan for me was Rogers QB one veteran backup uh, quarterback at spot number two, whether that's for set or whoever Tyron and then Howell at number three and give Howell the treatment that Zach Wilson should have got this past season. Yeah. He'd be in a great environment to learn from Aaron Rodgers too. So I, I like the one thing I like about how he's resilient. He was taking a beating. He kept getting back up, throwing the ball, trying to make plays resilient. The you know commanders were a mess. He was trying to, he's fighting through it and he's young and he learned a lot. So I like him a lot, to be honest with you. I, he's just, he's a, he's like a kind of a gunslinger in some aspects, which is fun to watch, but and you can learn from Rodgers. But to have him as your primary backup is kind of risky. I still would say, you know what? I'd rather have the percent. I'd rather have somebody else. But like, if you, in your plan, you want to have him like the third one. I'm fine with it. Let him sit and learn. And God forbid Rodgers retires this year, and you have Brissett and Howell next year as your quarterbacks. All right, that's at least you're you're not the cupboard's not obviously bare at that point. But interesting name, I like it. And it's like, and he's cheap. That's the most important thing because some of these backup quarterbacks are going to want what six, seven, eight, nine million dollars a year to come play here. Yeah, for sure. And like another thing too, or I guess maybe another pushback against Sam Howell to the Jets is if you're trading away at like a mid to late round draft pick, let's just, you know, throw out a fourth rounder, for example. Why don't you just use that fourth round pick on a quarterback? You get him in the building on a cheap four year deal. Yeah. He can sit behind Rodgers for two seasons, be ready to take over with a more built up team around him with the same amount of time that Howell will have on his deal this year. So that's kind of the pushback, whether it's like a Michael Pratt or who, you know, take your pick Spencer Rattler, you know, who, whoever, that's kind of another big argument. If you're trading away a mid round pick in this year's class, just go draft a rookie and have them for two extra years. Well, I think it's just the argument of the known versus the unknown. You've actually seen yep. him play in the NFL, what he can do under pressure, under duress, getting hit in a you know, chaotic scheme. Where it's like, all right, as opposed to a kid out of college where you don't know what you're getting. You have no idea. But I get it. I like especially Jet fans, like, no, we we want to draft our own guy. Well, you know, it's kind of a desperate times, desperate measures for this, but you can make a case for both guys, to be honest with you, both ways. Yeah. And how I mean, man, he threw for under four thousand yards, 21 TDs, 21 picks, did lead the NFL in interceptions and was benched last year. So it's not like Howell's the perfect quarterback out there. He's definitely not a sure thing. But to me, there is something there. You don't luck your way into throwing for 3,900 yards. Yeah. You know, no, it's, it's it's true. It's But it's interesting we're hearing, like, all these stories of how Joe Douglas likes certain guys and this and that. And that Tony Pauline article came out, which I'm sure you saw, where they said that I, Joe du- – I actually didn't read it. Oh, it was kind of more like where Joe Douglas kind of defers to Sala a lot in terms of personnel decisions. And the primary example was Will McDonald. They took Will McDonald because Sala wanted him. But JSN was actually Joe Douglas's choice. Like, so it was things like that where Salah has a lot more say in personnel than people realize. I'm not sure if I believe that or not, but that's interesting going into free agency and going into the draft because it's like, you know what? They both should be on the same page at this point. Like, we need offense, offense, offense. We, you know, you can't take a project player at this point. You, know, you need guys that can contribute this year to win, you know, win games and save their jobs, right? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, but I wonder if that like matches up with the draft video. You know, because it wasn't like Douglas was like pounding on the table, like, you know, Smith and Jig was on the board. We're taking them. You know, I remember him talking about like Michael Mayer and whatnot and, and like uh, Broderick Jones. They probably edited that, man. <laughs> Make themselves look good. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? But yeah, I mean, I, the whole thing is just so weird. I just want the Jets to be a, a normally ran organization, right? Yeah. Normal GM, normal head coach. We can balance out the team needs versus team talent. Yeah. Because although I love Will McDonald and I loved him back at Iowa State, and I think he's going to be a really good pro, if you looked at big boards from like the draft insiders, nobody had Will McDonald as like the top dude, like ready to go. Like, why is he at 15? Why is he falling? Yeah. I, I, I didn't recall a single person saying that. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. So, for, you know, from Joe Douglas, we've heard he wants to take the best player available. Um, so I, I don't know. The whole the whole thing is just – I'm with you. I want offense. I want to load this offense up because I also think that 
I, and I think it's a you know it's a credit to Saul and Ulbrich. It seems like they can really maximize guys in the late rounds. You know, Michael Carter was a late round find. Yep. You know, you look at some of these free agents, uh, like these random free agent acquisitions that the Jets are, you know, pulling off one year contracts and they're making it work. Solomon Thomas, Al Woods, I mean, Quincy uh, Williams was like a, a random find, yep. right? Bryce Huff. Came from Jacksonville, Bryce Huff. Yeah. They can develop players. Mm-hmm. So I get the allure like, hey, we can develop players. We know what we're doing. So let's go get guys with the ultra high ceilings like Will McDonald and Jermaine Johnson, but uh, Sauce Gardner too. But if you can go out and get a third round pick and because of coaching, you know, coach him up to play like a second round pick, that to me is huge. That That's super, super enticing. No, I completely agree. And the other thing, too, is that they got to figure out they got to figure out restructures because they got to create cap space. Now, the names that everybody yeah. keeps hearing, it's like C.J. Mosley, John Franklin Myers, guys like that, Lakin Tomlinson, possibly. Or you can do extensions, too, where you can extend D.J. Reed, Conklin, you know, Michael Carter second. Like, which, what do you expect to happen? Because things are going to have to happen over the next, what, three weeks? For sure. I, I think the first move here is extend DJ Reed, mm-hmm. uh, lower that number so it gives you more flexibility. I think you have to ask Lake and Tomlinson for a pay cut. Yeah. I think it's totally realistic. $18 million plus for below average guard play is just not, not normal, right? You, you don't see that across the NFL. Um, so, Two instances right off the bat, in my opinion, which are just totally, totally obvious. And I guess in the realm that Lakin says, no, I'm not taking one, you could either release him and save an, an extra 10 mil, but then open up a need at left guard, or you can potentially restructure. Yep. So uh, I guess you maybe make the same argument for Tyler Conklin. I just don't know if the Jets view him as like that long term, you know, if they want to extend him like right. on another three year deal or something. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think Lakin's the the bit the first one, and then purse. What you know, a couple names that I I've been seeing Quinny Williams and Quincy Williams as possible restructure guys. I'm not talking to them at all. Nope. They should not be. Their in my opinion, their contract should not be messed with. Yep. Whatsoever. CJ Mosley, I can understand. I, I I don't mind attempting it, but I, I I'm not looking to part ways with CJ Mosley whatsoever. No. No, he's the most. I think he's the most interesting one out of all of them. But wow, he handles it. You know, he he lo- apparently he loves it here. He wants to play at Rogers. He wants to be. You know, he wants to see this team come to fruition with the winning come to fruition finally. So, but he's interesting because he makes a, he makes a ton of money too, man. But it's like how many? Like how do you handle his contract? What do you do with him at this point? He's at you know how many more years do you have? I make like really good years do you have left in him. I'd probably say like two. Yeah, two more years. I mean, Mosley's he's a beast. He's like the heartbeat of the defense. You yep. know, I, I felt like really since Adams left, the Jets needed somebody like a, a veteran leader who can step in and just keep everybody on the same page. And Mosley, you know, he's that guy. And if you lose a CJ Mosley and I get like, you know, linebackers such a pe- people like do just, like these days, like a lot of fans just don't look at linebackers like that important anymore. Yeah. But like in that style of defense, if you have like an effective rangy linebacker yeah. or on top of it, the leadership stuff, that's super valuable. I mean, look at Fred Warner, what he does yeah. for the Niners. Yeah. You know, if the Niners did not have Fred Warner yeah. or they had the 20th or 25th ranked linebacker in yeah. place of Fred Warner, that defense would look a lot different. So yeah. again, I, I think – Again, just numbers on paper. It's easy to just say, "Oh, cut him, restructure this guy," you know, get, clear that clear that money because free agency is ahead, and we can go get like new players. But I don't know. I'm, I'm just not touching Quinnen's deal. I'm not messing around with Quincy Williams' deal. Nope. Um, I would maybe attempt mostly, but if he's not really feeling it, then I'm not going to rock the boat. Um, but Lakin for sure, Lakin for sure. And then with DJ Reed, I, I'm I'm 100 interested in an extension. Yeah, no doubt about that. Now, the one player is interesting. I looked at his contract. But I forgot to do it before. Is what's Alan Lazard's contract like? Because coming off his year, you've got to be like, you know, it's a disappointment. Can he be restructured or can you manipulate his money at all? Let me double check on that. Let me pull it up. Um, I forgot to look before. I was going to do it. I forgot. I figured you knew everything. So I figured you'd know it. <laughs> <laughs> so he signed a four year, $44 million deal, $10.9 million signing bonus, $22 million guaranteed. Obviously, it averages out to $11 million a season. And let's see here. Uh, dead cap hit, but that's factoring in last year. 
Okay, so he's an unrestricted free agent in 2027. Okay. He is a cap hit this year of 12.1. Dead cap of 18.7. So next year in 2025 looks to be the deal or looks to be the year where you can move on, right. where he would have $22 million left over those two seasons, 25 and 26. But he's only owed uh, or would only be a $6.5 million dead cap hit. So you would save whatever it is, 13, right. my math is horrible, $13 million over the two years by right. just parting ways with them. And dude, even we even heard Sala like slip up in that press conference talking about Lazard. I think it was post game, like, oh, he's only going to be here for the next year and a half or whatever he yeah, said. He did, yep. Yeah. But I was just trying to figure, trying to find, you're trying to find money somewhere, trying to figure, but then it's like, do you really want to like manipulate his contract and have him here a couple more years when you probably don't want him here? Unless he completely breaks out this year, I guess, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, that that's, you know, an, another thing. It, it's like as, as bad as Lazard was a year ago, there's a reason why Roger, you know, why the Jets gave him a, a, a huge contract. Yeah. Right. Like they, there, there has to be some foresight there. And there, I, I'm just, I don't really believe that Lazard just cashed in, gave up. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what happened there, I man. He was inactive. You got to hope that Aaron Rodgers coming back and playing, you know, he said he's going to be a more of like a mentor to him and more active, like in his life, just to kind of get him back into it. I mean, he's got, he can't be this bad. He can't be inactive every week. You got to get something out of him at this point, especially at that price tag. Yeah. A hundred percent. And and also too, you know, if, if Rodgers is out, is out there and you expect, doesn't matter who the receivers are, all their, all their expected numbers are, are should go up really. Yeah, no, I agree. No, that's cool. I was wondering about that. You're trying to find cap space somewhere, man. So it's just you dig around and search, and there's not really many options. You figure Uzama's going to be gone. Some obvious cuts. Yeah. And then, then you got to also spend money on Morstad and Zerline, Ashton Davis. You got to bring guys back. And then the whole Bryce Huff thing, it looks like that's going to be a foregone conclusion. He's going to be gone. So, yeah. I mean, dude, we have a lot of, or I guess Joe Douglas has a lot of work cut out for him this offseason, man. Like, there's a lot of different question marks. But I, I think the good news. The problems are like crystal clear. Yep. O line, wide receiver, backup quarterback, maybe safety depth. Yep. Um, and then you have two or really, th- really four areas to to fill those needs with free agency, trades, draft, and then waiver pickups. So, yeah, I'm curious to see like what the, if the players anybody takes a discount to stay here or a discount to play with Rodgers. That was rumored last year, but we didn't, didn't really see it. Does it actually happen this year? Like, all right, you know, I'm going to buy into your program. I'll do that. Or it's going to be like, you know what? Pay me. If you don't pay me, I'm not staying. You're like, especially like Morstat and Zerline, who were like, they're beloved here. I mean, Morstat was on the friggin' like MVP of this. Everybody loved them and all this other stuff. So I'm curious to see how much they actually take to stay here. Yeah. I would also maybe include like running back as well, like a third down back. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, because I, I just don't see the Jets just going into next season with two running backs on the roster. And nope. that, that's that's it. One is, you know, improving in, in or unproven in, in uh, Izzy's. But I think that's going to do it for me, man, unless you had any more topics. No, we covered a lot. No, I mean, it's, I'm excited, man. Now you just kind of watch and keep seeing like the Mike Evans news is big for me. And I go look up that now. But it's just you got to watch daily. Who's getting cut? What's the rumors? Who's going to stay? Who gets a new contract before free agency starts? So it's uh, yeah, it gets tagged, too. Yeah, who gets tagged too? That starts now. Yeah, too. It's gonna be interesting. Yeah, but for my for dude, for me, I'm hoping Pittman hits the free agent market. That's that that's the dude that I'm like really trying to f- zero in on. Cal Calvin is so so exciting too. Um, I would be totally pumped with either of those guys. Yeah, I think to me it's like Pittman, Ridley, and then I start lowering my expectations. I don't think Higgins is gonna happen. So I'm kind of like, I'll start looking elsewhere. For sure, for sure. All right, well, I think that's going to do it for us. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, go Jets.